Hello and welcome to our special session of the Russia Question. I'm your host, Michael Osorgin. Uh, this is an initiative of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center. Uh, we have several other initiatives, among which are uh, Public Orthodoxy, our journal, and you can look at our site, um, uh, Public Orthodoxy, to learn more about uh, those initiatives. Um, we are so fortunate, and, and I'm so pleased to welcome our two guests to the show today to make sense of uh, Alexei Navalny's very important legacy. Um, we have uh, Sister Vasa Larin, uh, who is a Russian Orthodox liturgi uh, liturgiologist, and Ryasa Fornan. She is the host of the online um, cate hmm, catechetical programs. Coffee with Sister Vasa, an author of many scholarly articles, a monograph on Byzantine hierarchical liturgy, uh, reflections with morning coffee with Sister Va uh, Lent with Sister Vasa, uh, healthy fast Lenten guidebook, and most recently Praying in Time, uh, which I own and is a wonderful book. The hours and days in step with Orthodox Christian tradition. Uh, this book is now translated into Italian, Greek, and German. Sister Vasa's online mission includes a daily newsletter with a brief reflection on scripture, now available also in audio form on selfie.com, that's with two L's, a uh, weekday audio podcast called Monday Morning Coffee on the practical applications of liturgical calendar and scripture, uh, a video course on divine liturgy available on YouTube, and over 300 uh, other YouTube videos on Orthodox theology, tradition, and modern day issues of Orthodox canon law and church life. Uh, welcome, Sister Vasa. We're so fortunate to have you with us. Uh, we are also here with Sergei Chepnin, who serves as Director of Communications at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center of Fordham University and its chief editor of Dar I, right? Dar I, uh, the gifts. In other words, Almanac of Contemporary Russian Culture in Russian. Uh, previously, he held various roles within the Moscow Patriarchate, uh, including executive editor of the Church Herald newspaper and the Journal of Moscow Patriarchate, deputy chief editor of the Moscow Patriarchate Publishing House, and secretary of the Church, State, and Society Commission of the Interconciliar Board of the Russian Orthodox Church. He has also taught as a senior lecturer at St. Tihon Orthodox Humanitarian University, Faculty of Theology, and curated exhibitions on contemporary Christian art. A prolific author, Chepnin's articles and commentary have been featured in numerous national and international media outlets, including Bloomberg, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, BBC, and The Economist. He is the author of two books in Russian, um, The Church in Post-Soviet Russia, Revival, Quality of Faith, and Dialogue with Society, published in 2013, and The Russian Church Revival, a summary, published in 2018. Uh, so to both of you, welcome, and thank you for being here. I would like to start our conversation off uh, with something that was published by Public Orthodoxy, and it's uh, Inga Leonova's article. It's hard to do a better job of summarizing um, Navalny's legacy than, than uh, Inga does in this article uh, called Greater Love Has No One Than This to Lay Down One's Life for One's Friends, right? Um, of referencing referencing uh, scripture. And this was uh, published on February 26th uh, of this year. Um, and on Friday, February 16th, she writes, 2024, Russian penitentiary service uh, that is responsible for the thriving gulag system, informed the world that Russia's prisoner number one, that is Alexei Navalny, collapsed during the daily walk in the camp and died shortly thereafter. While everyone who cared about Navalny had feared for his life every day since January 17th, 2021, when he returned to Russia after recovering in Germany, from an assassination attempt by the Kremlin, the news still came out as a gut-punching shock. Despite three years of imprisonment in inhuman, torturous conditions, despite knowing that Putin hated and feared him so much that he couldn't utter his name, despite the record of the Russian gulag system, Navalny loomed larger than life, uh, unbreakable, always smiling, always filled with joy, hope, and humor. 
His posts on social media conveyed by his fearless team were inspiring, funny, and above all, free. The words of someone whose freedom was, quote, not of this world, whose courage was based in faith that moves mountains. The day before the devastating news, he appeared in a brief court video laughing and mocking the federal judge. He just couldn't have died. And he couldn't have left those he loved and served with all his being. So I would like to turn uh, first to Sergei Chepnin and, and then to Sister Vasa to ask uh, this following question, because it's an odd set of circumstances when a critique of the state necessarily entails a critique of the Orthodox Church. But Navalny found himself precisely under those circumstances and preceded with this critique not only despite being a practicing Orthodox Christian, but perhaps in defense of Orthodox Christianity. I am certain that Navalny courageously spoke the truth that is testified to his conscience in word and deed. Um, in addition, in that same article by Inga Leonovas, uh, 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 with which we began, uh, Sister Vasa, you recently released not one, but two videos addressing whether Alexei Navalny is a martyr, one in English and one in Russian. Um, the question of martyrship strikes me as difficult to resolve in either or fashion, but but I would like to hear from each of you. Uh, I would like for each of you to state your case for the viewers. Uh, why not simply state that he fought for his family's and country's freedom, as he claims in Daniel Rohner's documentary uh, called Navalny, which was released in 2022. Uh, in short, how do you view Navalny's legacy within Orthodox Christianity? Uh, Sergei, would you begin, please? Yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think, well, there are three main uh, domains are that are Navalny uh, was kind of exist. He was, of course, our first of all, Russian politician. And I would say kind of the, the number one, if we are speaking about Russian politics, or that is not linked to Kremlin. Then he was a businessman. And then he was an Orthodox Christian. And of course, uh, after his uh, murder, uh, the kind of the spiritual dimension, the religious dimension um, is uh, the most important one uh, from my perspective. And uh, what is interesting about Navalny is that he uh, represented a different type of our uh, faith, I would say, in contemporary Russia, because the uh, kind of the, the general presupposition is that, well, we have the Russian Orthodox Church, this is the, the official church, and you're a Christian to the extent that you attend uh, churches, you participate in parish life, uh, and uh, in a way that means in the you know, this post-Soviet uh, uh, situation, that uh, the are uh, your are uh, kind of relation to to the church as so, sort of organization as corporation is much more important than your personal faith, and in case of Navalny, it's kind of totally different. He just showed that there is no monopoly, uh, so to say, uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church over the Christian belief uh, in Russia. He represented his really deep, I believe, really deep or personal faith, his our understanding of uh, the gospel. And uh, that was a way of life for him, uh, quite unusual, uh, again, I would say in Russian situation, in short. Great, thank you, uh, Sister Vasa. So I understood you correctly that uh, we're supposed to talk about stating a case for for or not for his martyrdom. Yes. Uh, so, uh, well, I, I think that thank you, by the way, for inviting me to this. It's wonderful to be here with you and all the participants. Uh, I did say uh, Navalny, uh, I think, uh, were we to recognize him as a martyr, as many people already do, um, I think would qualify uh, in all the senses that martyr, the word mar martyr means. Hmm. Because I think the questions that arise 
if we ask whether or not somebody is a martyr, uh, are that, well, this word, uh, you know, what does it mean? Martyr, martyros, uh, the etymology is contested. However, it has to do with, uh, it's connected apparently to uh, either both or one of, uh, you know, the, these words like merimenao, to uh, think uh, earnestly, uh, and also Professor Vasily Vasilyevich Bolotov connected it to, uh, which he considered all these words connected, uh, to the Latin uh, memorare, uh, to remember, but there is a connection to a painful remembrance. Someone who knows something, remembers it, has been witness to it, and witnesses to this, getting to the term, you know, martyrdom, in a situation that is risky. So uh, the one question is, was Alexei Navalny uh, a man of faith? And was he the kind of man of faith that witnessed uh, in a way that in, enticed, you could say, the anger of the forces against that true faith, faith in the true God? So was that the reason or was it just politics? Uh, and I think that this question of was this just politics uh, arises in the cases of other martyrs that we have. It arises in the case of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was about politics. It was political. He was not a friend of Caesar's. Uh, and the Romans would come and take our people and our place, said the Jewish religious authorities. Mm. So there was a political problem with what Jesus Christ was saying and doing and that it wasn't status quo. So uh, we could say, is that, you know, is that like Christian test, is Christ's testimony a Christian testimony <laughs> or is it just politics? And then we have the, the recent martyrs like uh, Maria Skopsova, uh, like uh, Alexander Schmorell, that in the Nazi times, uh, also created a political problem by being nonconformists according to the policies of that regime. That was not explicitly a satanic regime. It was not explicitly against uh, the faith system, say, of Orthodox Christianity. However, this witness was so, uh, even though these people were uh, to that degree faithful to Christ that their witness was uh, impactful enough that it was rocking the boat of the powers that be. Now, with Alexei, I think that Alexei, as he himself testified, not only in several posts, one can look at his interview in Pravmir when he was running for mayor of Moscow, one can look at uh, various posts throughout the years that he made about his faith, where he explicitly said that what he fights for uh, ever since he came to believe uh, when he was, I think he was 25, uh, right after his daughter was born, uh, he came to believe this is a man who had this change of mind, this testimony to a changing person. He changed in many ways, actually, and we saw him grow also as a politician, he grew. But he uh, became a problem because as he wrote, his values were specifically Christian values. He compared the, the difficulties that those who have, his followers, he said, and he's, he, you know, he speaks both to the faithful and not faithful, but he says, let's think about him on his, the possible uh, message that he sent that I shared in my video, uh, both in the Russian and the English one that Alexei wrote. He's like, let's think about him, how difficult it was for him. You know, the, the religious mm. authorities were against him. The, the police were after him and so forth. Um, he really saw his uh, journey and his testimony as a Christian fight. And he understood well that a lot of his, most of his uh, con uh, frères or whatever you call them in English uh, of his team, uh, even though there are several who are people of faith, like uh, Lyubov Sobel, uh, I can't name others right now uh, in his specific team. But anyway, uh, he writes 
you know, that freedom and life and the fact that he, he several times would say in his letters that he doesn't believe in death, that this comes from his his belief in the resurrection. So mm. Alexei testifies uh, specifically to uh, a Christian faith. And uh, I don't see any, uh, uh, in fact, I would be hard put to see a reason for him not to be recognized as a martyr. And there's vast, uh, you know, that he's like a magnet. His his grave is a magnet to so many people. Uh, it's already become a pilgrimage, you know, destination. Uh, so I guess my answer, that would be my case. And on the other side, uh, I would have to uh, respond. Is it okay if I do one more thought? Absolutely. From the side of the, the anger that he enticed by his very Christ-like also return, when Christ returns to Jerusalem and all the disciples are like, are you mad? And Peter says, let this not be with you, you know, when he decides to go back to Jerusalem and Peter's, uh, and Christ says to him, you know, go behind me, Satan, you speak that which is, you know, that of man and not of God. Anyway, but the question is, are the authorities that put Alexei to death, are they actually uh, from the other side, metaphysically speaking. Mm. And I think that we know enough about this weird occultism that actually is uh, what today uh, the post-Soviet, uh, you know, uh, Russian orthodoxy in its highest echelons, of course, not everybody, and there are a lot of good faithful people in the Russian Orthodox Church, but those in power that has very much almost irrecognizably, you know, uh, from the regime, uh, merged with the regime, are into an occultist kind of, uh, you could say, faith, a faith that I call occultist because when you see the patriarch, uh, you know, carrying on with icons, with relics, Putin uh, is it's somehow involved in this, the holy symbols have, uh, you know, a certain power for these people that uh, different from the Christian faith and the way of the cross, uh, believes that if you do certain manipulations with either objects or, you know, rituals of a certain sort, without changing yourself, without mm -hmm. any decision on your own, uh, of your own, to uh, actually, you know, change, um, you can you can achieve certain changes, or you can achieve what you want by manipulating those, let's say, divinities that you are serving, and that's the mm -hmm. way occultism works, as distinct from the faith of the church and the sacraments of the church. I think that this has become. The big thing, I think the patriarch really believes that if he comes in possession of this magic icon or of these relics like Alexander Gniewski or the Trinity icon, um, or if he goes, you know, with his car with an icon in it, um, whatever else the regime is doing uh, and having murderous intentions, torturing now people before any uh, court of law, that's it. That's my thought that I think these are I think metaphysically speaking, there is a very evil um, uh, kind of uh, conglomeration in power there that has been very irritated by a voice so pure and so free and so Christ-inspired as that of Navalny. It's led me wonderful. Maybe... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, so there's I a think, what, yes. what... Mm -hmm. It is very important, yes, I agree with uh, Sister Vasa, uh, to stress uh, that uh, this our political dimension really merges with the religious and, for example, um, and even kind of magic, because Putin himself, when Navalny was alive, he never pronounced uh, Navalny's name. Mm. And that was, uh, you know, for years and years and years, uh, he had to uh, address uh, the uh, manifestations or some ideas or uh, 
uh, interviews uh, that Navalny gave, uh, but uh, he was uh, Putin was always also always saying just uh, uh, substituting his name with uh, weird things. So we all of course understand that that's about Alexei Navalny. Uh, but uh, for the first time, he pronounced his name only I think a few weeks after his uh, murder. So that's mm -hmm. uh, definitely the. Are kind of this kind of uh, magic that uh, merges politics, or that uh, in in a way, in a non-Christian way, definitely in a non-Christian way. And on the other hand, of course, are uh, Navalny, who is uh, who was using all the opportunities, or uh, whether it's um, uh, Easter or celebrations, uh, or even his kind of last word uh, in the court uh, when he was. Um, uh, making clear and uh, really, uh, I would say, uh, absolutely Christian statements, not kind of political and Christian, not uh, kind of manula ma manipulative uh, and Christian, but clearly are kind of are, um, uh, giving uh, account of his uh, faith and belief. And the, the strongest point, I think there are two strongest points. One is that he was uh, used to say all the time, don't give up. Uh, you should be patient. You should have a hope. And uh, the other thing, uh, which is even more surprising, is that he really did believe that there is no death. And this is not just his uh, kind of regular Christmas greeting. But uh, even in a few interviews, he used to say there is no death, and our, you know, it's it's a very strong statement, uh, and now we know that this is not uh, just uh, just words, but he was acting and kind of living his life according uh, according to this. Um, so much to discuss between what each of you has has said. Uh, Sister Vas, if I may go off script for us, just one quick second here. I I realize, uh, and my audience has come to know me to speak about terms and things in terms of Dostoevsky and the Brothers Karamazov, but there's one important lesson in there uh, that Zosima tells uh, Fyodor Karamazov, which is, above all, do not lie to yourself. And I realize by your analysis of the etymology of martyr, that he's in a way speaking about martyrdom, that is a kind of earnestness with oneself internally and with one's conscience. And it needs to begin at home, right? That's that's the idea of the book is that it starts with the first step at home, and then you're able to sort of speak truth outside of the home, right? Or, or confess and witness outside of home. Once you've undergone that process of what you're describing as this kind of self-examination, right? Uh, the kind of antithesis to this uh, very power-hungry, sort of object-oriented, manipulative faith, right? That the the truth in power, or power in truth, excuse me, uh, that comes from being honest with oneself and then honest with one, <laughs> others around. Uh, yes, oneself. and Ixay was very irritated by the lying. And when in his last words, he had several last words because they kept trumping up new charges against him, even when he was imprisoned, you know, they would extend his sentence with these trumped up charges that saying that he's, you know, had business shenanigans. To call Alexei, like, above all, like a businessman before he's an Orthodox Christian, I would disagree with this, that he was he started out in in business endeavors however he didn't own a single uh piece of property he was mm -hmm. not a man who pursued his business career he entirely uh became uh, a man of this vocation of this enormous witness coming up against this dragon you know like he went and in, also right into the belly of the beast um but he was uh you know when he returned but he said in his last word after his uh, initial arrest, after his return, he quoted one of the Beatitudes, right? As everybody knows, but the translation into English doesn't uh, clearly pass on the way he understood it because he said, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for truth because pravda mm. 
it, he said, and he quoted it in Church Slavonic, mm. showing also in several of his posts, he showed that he knew what church life was. He knew how people behaved in church. Um, he, anyway, he was someone who naturally uh, s quoted in Church Slavonic uh, the gospel. So anyway, he said, Blessed are those who thirst and uh, hunger and thirst for truth, for they shall be satisfied. Mm. And in that whole speech, he's talking about he doesn't want his children to, to grow up and their children to grow up in a country where everyone lies, where everybody says everybody understands everything, even though they're being lied to. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he definitely had uh, this, uh, this, you know, irritation, you could say allergy to the lying. And I think his whole battle with corruption was also, um, you know, something that was an inner need of his to speak out against. Right. And then the uh, he found the sort of exact point where to apply pressure on the dragon, right? And it's on these terms of but he also warned, truth, right? He warned, see. Yes, he mm -hmm. warned how, how dangerous the corruption was. So, and this was before, years before this, this bloody war that's just snowballing into God knows what's next you know but he was warning how this is all this is at the heart of it the other heart of it was the the corruption and tortures in the prison system so his targeting by offering himself into it was mm. another thing russia's present day culture is very colored by both the fear of going to a penal colony and this living memory of sort of this gulag uh situation and anyway, that's all I'll say about that. Wonderful. Um, I I want to mention to our audience that at any point you can drop questions into the Q&A and I'll relay them after we've had our sort of um, initial conversation. Uh, and I would like to move on to the second one. Um, Sergei, would you be able to sort of describe the conditions of the management of the of Navalny's funeral, uh, and I would like to know how each of you views uh, the official management of his murder and, and burial. Yes, it's a, it's a very, uh, I would say, fascinating story, because as you know, our, our, it was unclear until the very last moment whether the family will be, uh, will, will get the body or not, and when that will happen. And then uh, for almost a week, there were a lot of attempts to find a hole or for, uh, or, or for their farewell. Uh, and our, uh, the, there was such a, uh, such a pressure on all our, our kind of property landlords, uh, owners of different holes. Uh, in Moscow itself, that it was absolutely impossible to find rent or whatever, uh, get any any space for that. So mm -hmm. the only public space during the funeral was uh, the church in Moscow suburbs, and this church was in the region where, in the part of Moscow where uh, Navalny uh, lived, and it was just kind of five minutes by car or 30 minutes work from this church to the cemetery uh, where he was uh, buried. So the uh, the church wasn't that big, uh, but at the same time, it wasn't small. But what happened, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the church was almost closed and controlled not just by the police, but also by FSB officers since uh, the early morning, the, the day of the funeral. So the funeral took place in the afternoon. Uh, in the morning, there was a liturgy, then Modeben, then our General Panihida. Uh, so those who came early in the morning, say at eight o'clock in the morning, they managed to get uh, uh, to the church easily. Those who came an hour late at nine o'clock, uh, they already uh, had to pass security check. And then it was almost impossible to enter the church. The church was controlled uh, by the police. The churchyard was controlled by the police. Uh, and what is interesting, and uh, this is a very
we uh, have Very experienced to uh, we, could you could you rewind a few seconds you've uh, you cut out for just a moment okay I think this is the problem uh, because of the earthquake that we had earlier today uh, so the there were a few church singers that were or uh, will be the who will be happy to join the choir to sing during the funeral and it so happened that uh, they were my friends but they didn't know each other and they asked me to organize the small choir to sing uh, during the funeral. So I did that the day before. Uh, one of them, are, one of the singers, gets uh, to the church, uh, but the rector said, no, uh, you won't be allowed to sing uh, in the church. Uh, we'll, we'll have a choir, and that's enough. And actually, they had only just two singers in the choir. Uh, so uh, because the, the, the uh, church was almost block, uh, blocked, this choir uh, actually joined these uh, kind of uh, 10,000, 15,000 crowd outside outside the churchyard. And they were singing uh, Panihida and other church hymns outside the church. And uh, that was, uh, you know, that was a very powerful symbol that, of course, there is a church that is somehow are locked uh, within the kind of within the church space. And is not ready to kind of to to get out and reach out the people outside the church, but uh, from the crowd, uh, there are also kind of voices. There are prayers, uh, and that was uh, in this small choir. I would say dozens of people. I would say best uh, one of the best singers in, in Moscow. Uh, they they were kind of moving around. They were in this long long uh, kind of choir to the church, then they get closer to the church. So they were singing in different locations. And that was exactly, uh, that was the symbol, uh, I would say, of uh, uh, Navalny's kind of type of faith. So you're with people. Well, there is official church somewhere there, but there, there are those who pray with you, who pray among you. And um, uh, so many people, uh, as far as I know, were really kind of trying to sing with this uh, choir or just saying, well, we're atheists, but we feel that this this prayer is very important today here for us too. And um, yes, that that was manifestation uh, of, our, uh, of something that definitely uh, Alexei Navalny uh, would like. This is a lovely story I'd like to respond to as well. Uh, Sister Vavasa, do you have anything to add to the official conditions? Well, well, uh, it, it, a, a, a wise uh, woman in my life <laughs> at a very young age, um, I'm speaking of my mother, of course, always told me something interesting about the story of the, of noble, the noble Joseph, right? Uh, and it's, say what you will about how you will interpret what was done it seems that what stands out uh, at least is a good, a decent person doing a good small thing, right? Just amidst shouting, amidst sort of turmoil, amidst chaos, insisting on taking uh, Jesus brought down Christ down from the cross and burying him and giving, doing this sort of simple act of kindness. I, I mean, in a way, I feel like the 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 parallel the the parallel choir outside of the official church is is just that kind of act of kindness uh, and it's really a, a lovely thing it's also a, a very tactful form of protest coincidentally right that by doing a decent thing and by being kind in this way and thoughtful in this way you're actually protesting right so it's it's a lovely combination of things that you put together and, and um uh, wonderful that you were a part of that, Sergei. Um, I would uh, turn us to our third question, uh, which is, um, you know, quoting from another public orthodoxy article written shortly after Navalny sparked the largest protest to date um, in 2021 uh, during Putin's rule. Um, the article cites the head of the Department for External Church Relations of the Russian Orthodox Church, Metropolitan Larian uh, Afiev, at the, uh, at the time stated in his television program 
that the involvement of children and youngsters in the protest movement was unacceptable, unacceptable because the youth should remain outside politics. This is, of course, a highly politicized statement um, that calls for subservience to Putin's status quo, right? Um, although I'm sure he wouldn't admit that. <laughs> and Metropolitan Alarion is not alone in defending Putin's status quo in favor of this kind of apolitical um, quietism. I don't know. Uh, so uh, my question to both of you is, where are our Navalny's among Russian Orthodox clergy under Putin's Kirill? And Sergey, would you like to be awesome. uh -huh. Okay, I'll just start. Well, I think it is extremely important. That was uh, back in uh, um, uh, 2017, 2018, uh, when the, our, our higher school, our students were involved in protests. And I would say they were the majority of those who were protesting in different cities um, uh, of Russia from from. Siberia to Central Russia and on. So um, uh, that was a big surprise uh, because uh, by that time it was more or less clear that you know there is no public politics in Russia. And uh, while well, we have Putin, we have Kremlin, we have kind of official political parties, uh, period. Uh, nothing else is possible. And a lot of people, well, I would say I myself, uh, we were uh, by that time uh, sure that kind of nothing is possible, no kind of political action is possible, and we were not uh, that active by that time. But surprisingly, uh, during the kind of years, kind of starting say uh, 2009, 2010, uh, because of the use of social media, uh, more and more. Uh, not just teenagers, uh, but I would say starting from uh, nine, um, ten-year-old uh, um, children, were kind of following up uh, the uh, Navalny's uh, social media, video blog, and so on. So uh, by uh, 2017, uh, there was a clear group, there was a, a new generation kind of uh, grew up uh, ready for some sort of uh, political action because of Navalny. And that was a big surprise uh, for uh, for Kremlin and for Putin. And I think uh, somehow uh, at, at that time, uh, Navalny became the enemy of uh, Putin. Uh, of course, uh, well, there were a lot of uh, a lot of things happening uh, happened before. Uh, but uh, that was a real danger for the regime uh, uh, because, well, the, 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 where, where else you can find uh, kind of thousands of our school children participating or as a majority participating in different uh, kind of uh, non-official uh, uh, political uh, actions. So, um, of course, our when we're speaking about the church, the church was totally on the side um, of, uh, of the Russian state. Uh, and uh, the most uh, kind of convenient position was uh, just not to recognize this reality at all. So the Navalny, it seems, uh, it seemed to me that our, uh, Navalny just uh, didn't exist uh, from our, the uh, perspective of the official church Peter Kirill, whatever, Metropolitan Hilarion, and so on. So uh, the, 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 the main position will is to, to ignore this reality uh, totally. Thank you, Sister Basso, please. So uh, thank you also to Sergei. Uh, I, this, this kind of manipulation of this, uh, you know, uh, kind of dirtiness of politics, supposedly, uh, and that somehow, sometimes they say, uh, those who want you to shut up uh, about certain things uh, that are uncomfortable or against the Putin regime will say that the church has to stay out of politics on the one hand, or they will use something 
like metropolitan Ilarion used that the the young people uh, should be out of politics, but the Febaka, the Navalny's uh, organization, the fund for the battle against corruption, was charged with uh, there was some kind of you know uh, penal like I don't know how to say it right now correctly. But there was a charge, uh, according to which people were arrested for uh, somehow corrupting the youth and uh, maybe mm-hmm. drawing, dragging them into extremism or something like this. Uh, but Metropolitan Hilarion is using this sort of, he a priori is uh, saying that politics are something bad because it's very important for a dictatorship for people to be not involved, for there to be no civil society, and by all means for them not to come together, because when they're separate, then they are not dangerous. So somebody who could bring them together and make them feel a unity uh, was very, very dangerous. And I think that it's important to see sometimes that there's a lot of this manipulation going on where uh, someone indicates it, Putin's very good at this, like it's a KGB kind of, uh, I think, method to uh, get everybody to discuss something that's not the point, that's not the problem, right? Uh, and they float a premise that is already wrong. The fact to, to pretend that the church is outside of politics, uh, and let's just take specifically this particular uh, church structure that just came out with this uh, very horrible document uh, in which, uh, as you know, they call themselves a council. All of the holy symbols of orthodoxy are sabotaged and used in the name of just purely anti-Christian stuff. So it's the Russian world or the all world Russian uh, council, no more and no less. So I wanna just point out that This uh, document has out of its uh, seven sections, three of the sections have the word politica in them, uh, uh, entitled. It's they have a whole like the church for some reason is has a whole chapter here on Vnieshnia politica, external politics. Then there's a uh, a whole section on uh, family and demographical politics that they have suggestions to the government uh, on. Then there is the migration or emigration politics, migrazione politica, which is a big uh, important thing right now uh, to rev up the anti-foreigner fascist uh, ideology that's now exploded after the, uh, the terror act in Krokus City Hall. So uh, the church itself is uh, A-OK with being uh, you know, elbow deep in very bloody even politics. Um, But the minute uh, that uh, somebody, uh, you know, is involved in politics, in the kind of politics that they don't agree with, well, then that is a dirty business. And, you know, we don't do politics. I think it's actually sinful today when, uh, when in the name of supposedly a political ideology, but I think that it also has to do with a very demonic one. Um, We are told that we should be silent about that. I think it's important not to be manipulated or bullied into, uh, you know, thinking that it's bad to speak out. Or if we're told just pray and shut up, well, the the venerable Kassiani, the the nun that was sort of uh, could speak back to emperors, you know, she said, I hate silence when it is time to talk. So, you know, there was no uh, this people pleasing kind of, okay, your eminence, you know, we we will be silent about uh, this things that are are actually uh, killing, you know, killing corrupting, the silence is corrupting. The silence uh, makes people hate themselves for not speaking. The silence makes people be scandalized about the church that seems to have lost uh, her salt and so on.
this uh, lovely i i i it reminds me of sort of the the freedom that um was uh, written on Navalny's face with grief for his return to Russia, right? That, or, or the the joy that he was able to sort of express honestly, sincerely towards the end, right? That it was the opposite of of that pain of knowing that you're not saying something, right? Uh, because because he had the courage to speak out uh, where most people would sort of choose to to suffer in silence in a way that only it, it leads to more suffering, right? Something along those lines. Uh, and I do have more questions, but we have several in the Q&A, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning to them. Uh, so we hear from Rebecca Harris Hunt. I'm very, very happy that Navalny may be considered a martyr as I feel he is. However, if that is expected to come up through uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, how will it possibly find favor? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, of, well, of course, uh, this is just the public discussion and our uh, different people are involved, but this is not on the, of course, uh, on the institutional level. This is more like public discussions and politicians are involved and some uh, and clergy is involved, and lay people are involved. Uh, but, uh, well, it's just our, I think, a little bit more than less than two months since the murder of Alexei, so it's a it's a long process. Uh, we couldn't expect that uh, that will happen in the nearest future, but definitely, uh, I think it's very important to uh, kind of to shape out what are do we mean today by uh, by holiness? What is that in the in the twenty first century? And what is that when, how we could apply that to uh, a person who was involved in politics? Because there is no uh, Christian politics in Russia at all, while we have the biggest, uh, well, so to say, biggest uh, Orthodox Church uh, uh, in the Russian world, uh, in, the, in the whole world. Uh, but uh, there is no Christian politics in Russia. And Navalny was, I would say, the, 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 the only one who was uh, trying to, to introduce it in Russia. Uh, uh, and um, that, that could be one of the ways. Uh, the other is that uh, what uh, Sister Vasa said in the very beginning, uh, the martyria, the, the witness. Uh, so um, I think uh, we are just uh, um, uh, at the very beginning of this discussion. But I think it should go both on uh, different levels, uh, including kind of theological reflections on that. Um, and I hope maybe by the end of the year, um, uh, we as Orthodox Christian Studies Center uh, will uh, make a small conference on political canonizations uh, uh, with respect to mm. um, Alexei Navalny. At least that's the plan. Sister Vasa, would you uh, care to add anything to that question? How will it take hold in the... Uh... I think that many, mm -hmm. many uh, saints have been venerated, uh, venerated by the people way before uh, anybody put a stamp on that stamp of approval. I think that a lot of the time we end up straining a net uh, instead uh, in you know, and and we are given to swallow a camel. In other words, we we it's like Metropolitan Hilarion saying, "Oh, you know, like you could have." It's like the Pharisees saying when Jesus would heal someone, and then they would say, "Oh, but it was on the Sabbath." You know what I'm saying? So it'll be like, "Oh, but look at this." Like Ukraine has bombs falling, like Kharkov is being destroyed, a Russian speaking city, this beautiful city. They're trying, you know, they destroyed Mario. But, but no, our church outside Russia, well, my particular church, the only statements and very political ones have been made against the Zelensky administration for persecution of Christians in Ukraine. This is Ukraine's big problem. This is what the bishops say, write to your congressman. I quoted all of this in a, in a recent talk. Really? Is this the big problem? This is this is what keeps uh, people up at night in Ukraine? Uh, but not a word about Bucha, 
not a word about the deportation of children, not a word about the destroyed cities, the targeting of civilian infrastructure as we speak. You know what I'm saying? So this kind of, but will the church, uh, there will be, you know, it's not even a chance. You know, there's not a chance, as they say, of a snowball in hell that Navinely's name will be brought up. You couldn't even find a parish to serve a panihida uh, on the 40th day. You know what I'm saying? And we're talking about, well, hmm, will the Russian church? No, no, the Russian church is not going to even speak uh, his name. They are afraid this priest was considered a hero for coming on the 40th day and singing with his matushka with this very shaky, you know, a single voice, a little panihida on the 40th day of this great martyr. I think the church in future generations will be grateful that Alexei's long-suffering body uh, sanctified that church that was so scared to sing his funeral that they did it in 20 minutes. You try singing a funeral in 20 minutes, people are denying it, but no, people who were there, it was 20 minutes. That's what they did. Then they quickly, there's a video of it, started closing the lid. They didn't let anybody uh, say goodbye, except for the mother. And this was just part of the huge, you know, just trials that this family went through having lost such a son. You know what I'm saying? And we're asking, oh, well, will the Russian church? No, <laughs> it's a, this is a healing process that unfortunately is involving bloodshed because for the Russian church to rediscover uh, what it means to be church and to somehow be freed of this horrible hijacking of it, you know, by something very different from being church uh, is involving bloodshed. There's a, there are other holy witnesses like Vladimir Karamurza today in a very harsh penal colony who is writing things about ch the church uh, th that is very aware of his being an Orthodox Christian. All right. Sorry, Michael. That's it for me. No, no need for apologies. It's um, fascinating. And yes, uh, for those in our audience who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, nothing lasts a mere 20 minutes <laughs> in the church. No service of any kind. Um, uh, to Marco Pride, really. Uh, Andrew Fedosov asked something relative, pertinent to what we're discussing right now. Please remark on the glaring irony, something I've, I thought I've had as well, that, that the very authority who would bestow martyrdom upon the late conservative Alexei was complicit in his death even if by absence or silence to godless powers, he is a central figure in the, quote, end of the Russian Orthodox Church. He opposed Putin, not the church, and yet the bloodstains land on the church first. Uh, what other we like to speak to this irony? The tough one. <laughs> Um, uh, well, uh, um, yes, well, uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, today the Russian Orthodox Church is an integral part of Putin's regime. So when when you're saying that someone is uh, against uh, Kremlin, against Putin, then uh, the, the reaction of the church is that in a way uh, this kind of this person is against us, against the Russian Orthodox Church also, because the church cannot separate today itself uh, from the state. So um, when our, and I agree that um, that's in a way our, the, our, uh, the end, uh, the end uh, of the Russian Orthodox Church, or rather, I would say the, the, the version of, of the Russian Orthodox Church uh, that was created uh, by Stalin in uh, 1933. Uh, I would uh, I would think that uh, that's the very specific um, a specific version of uh, the Orthodox Church in Russia, and um, I do believe that we have a chance to uh, uh, restore the uh, the real Church. When that will happen, are sure I don't know. But uh, we do, or we should work on that, uh, and I think this is uh, this is the feeling of our quite some people in Russia within the church, 
including clergy, uh, including some bishops, um, I hope that uh, this uh, deep crisis, unbelievable crisis of the Russian Orthodox Church after the years of our real uh, religious revival is a great catastrophe. Uh, but uh, there should be a way out also. And in a way, our uh, Navalny uh, uh, is a sign of hope, uh, is a saint, but, well, I, I do believe, is a saint that, the, that we'll, we'll pray to, we're praying to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to restore uh, the real church of Christ uh, in Russia. Sister Vasa? I think uh, we're being asked to keep going with the questions because people have a lot of questions. There are so many that we had better. I agree. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, yes, let's, let's move to the next one. Um, let's see. Pedro Constantino writes, why have, you so, why have so many Orthodox priests revolted against Patriarch Kirill? And we haven't seen this behavior towards the leadership. Um, why hasn't a Navalny been born within the Russian Orthodox Church? Thank you. Could you read that again? I, I'm not seeing it and I can't really, I didn't understand. Yes, he says, why have so many Orthodox priests revolted against Patriarch Kirill and we haven't seen this behavior towards the leadership? I would need to know more about those instances personally, but why hasn't a Navalny been more uh, been born within the Russian Orthodox Church. Well, could we go to a question that's based on uh, true facts? Because actually, uh, so many Orthodox priests have not revolted against Patriarch Kirill, number one. And uh, Navalny, whose name is misspelled as Navalny, uh, mm. he says, why hasn't a Navalny been born within the Russian Orthodox Church? He was born within the Russian Orthodox Church. I mean, he became a believer because he had in his youth, uh, you know, not uh, come to believe, and then he did. So uh, both of the premises are wrong, and so I think we shouldn't discuss it. That's good that you have clarified. I was wondering about which revolting against Patriarch Patri Patri Kirill uh, was being referred to, because I don't know it. Uh, James Stevens. Your discussion of Alarion at the and the youth against the Kremlin system reminds me of the charges against Socrates in ancient Athens, uh, corrupting the young. It seems that history continues to repeat itself. Um, we may want to respond to that. Um, I don't or, think it's a question, though. Okay. Yeah, it's more of a commentary. Thanks Anatoly for the Yam comment, Steve. Yes, thank you for the comment. Anatoly Yampolsky, um writes, one of the stereotypes that come from the West about the Russian people are that they are incapable of grassroots political activism due to a psychological need for authoritarianism or a need to be, uni be united by a certain individual, in this case, Navalny. So he asks, how do you think the Russian people can overcome this assertion and show that they are not complicit with Putin while the majority continues to fear uh, the life-threatening repercussions of activ activism? I think Sigay would be better for this question. Maybe yeah. Sister Vas will start. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't really know what to um, say. Well, I think that our, our, uh, there are different generations are within Russia, and the younger generation is are much more free uh, and uh, ready to uh, speak out, and I would say ready for political action. So our... Mm, this general kind of presupposition that um, on the grassroots, the grassroots uh, political activism is somehow impossible is not true. This is one thing. And I think the other thing is that uh, Russian secret or uh, police uh, is very is very active. And that's a an important factor all over the country. They are trying to compromise local activists. They are trying to uh, uh, put them in prison for uh, just two, three words uh, written in social media. So uh, that's that's the uh, totalitarian state. How could you expect this kind of 
grassroots political, uh, real grassroots political activism in the totalitarian state. I would say today, believe me, today is simply uh, it's not possible. And uh, the, the this this manifestation when um, dozens of thousands of people. Uh, participated, uh, or what, at least trying to participate in Navalny's funeral, and they are day after day, week after week, were coming to Navalny's uh, grave, bringing flowers. I would say that's 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 really something very, very special, not just for Moscow but for the whole Russia, that there were um, uh, flowers, kind of. Uh, Hills of flowers every day, uh, bringing to uh, people were bringing to Navalny's grave. Uh, this is something very, very special, and uh, I think uh, this is a sign of hope. But again, uh, Russia is a totalitarian sta uh, state today, and uh, we should keep that in mind. Thank you. We have um, another from an anonymous attendee. Is there a role for the institutional church outside of Russia? to support recognition of Navalny's martyrdom? Um, there, you mean the Rokor? That's what it appears to be, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, perhaps there is also- a role, yeah. but uh, I don't really see any signs that the Rokor, maybe something will happen now after this really bad document about the Svishtyenda Vaina or, you know, the sacred war. Mm. Um, because that's really bad. But you think, how bad does it need to get for there to be a clear statement from uh, my particular church? It's sad for me. I'm, I don't say it with any, um, I don't know. It's It makes me very sad, but I have heard very unclear statements. There's this straining a gnat in order for us to swallow the camel. You know, oh, let's look at this. The 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 persecutions against Christians in Ukraine, um, yeah. So I, I, for one, I don't know what Sergei thinks, but I don't see uh, anytime soon. It, I would see sooner the OCA or the Ecumenical Patriarchate speaking up. Uh, you know, in this case, that I see these uh, jurisdictions at least, you know, having been a little well, a lot more free. Uh, you know, like in speaking against the Putin regime and his church. Sergei? Well, I, I agree. Unfortunately, the uh, the churches are of kind of Russian tradition, both in Europe and the United States, are especially sent in line uh, with the uh, uh, Moscow Patriarchate. So um, uh, I'm not sure that we can expect some serious steps uh, from uh, um, uh, from Rokor or uh, um, um, Russian Metropolia in Western Europe. Uh, so uh, this is an open question: Who will be are the uh, the voice? Uh, of, and that's generally speaking the big problem now. Who? Uh, what church is the voice of Free Russia? This is not definitely Moscow Patriarchate. Today, it's not the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia. Uh, but then who? Uh, it's um, We are, in a way, uh, Russian immigration. Uh, Russia is in the dead end. And Russian immigration also is in the dead end. So unfortunately, I have no question and no, no answer to this question today. It's a tragedy. Mm. Where does the Free Orthodox Church? Our ecclesiology that sees the church all the time as a specific synod making a specific document and making the specific statement is first of all it's wrong because the church is is broader more profound more uh, all-encompassing the you know the one holy catholic and apostolic church so when we are speaking my friends out there if you're still listening to this um you know, we are responsible for our church. We're all responsible. All of this bullying or thinking, oh, if Vladika doesn't like what I say, no, this helps actually. In the long run, it helps the bishops when they see that, oh, 
like the Russians say, Akazovitsa Tak Mozna Villa, you know, like they say, oh, it means we could have said it. We could have said it. Look, people are saying it. They're okay. They're not, you know, they haven't uh, been somehow, uh, they haven't died from saying it. Uh, say what you think. Uh, tell your bishops what you think. Tell your priests. And, uh, you know, be responsible. Because look at Alexei Navalny. This is a sign for all of us. You know, we have, uh, we're reluctant to recognize martyrdom in the lay people. I think that's why, uh, even though it also took a long time to, to canonize uh, uh, Maria Skopsova, um, the, the holy martyr, uh, but the lay people, it takes us a very long time. It took us over half a century to canonize and only locally did we canonize him, Alexander Schmorell, whose head was chopped off for crying out loud at age 24. You know what I'm saying? Like good old fashioned like martyrdom, but did, I never even heard of him, and I grew up in the Rokor. He was Rokor, you know, in Munich. Was Did anybody care about him? Where was his bishop? Ah, uh, let's look at where the bishops were, you know, during the Nazi time. Where these kids in the White Rose, the Die Weisse Rose, uh, the resistance to Hitler, they didn't have the support of their clergy. Hans and, uh, and Sophie uh, Scholl, the Protestants that were his friends, they all did this together, um, printing the, you know, the forbidden uh, leaflets against the Hitler regime, all on the basis of Christian faith. They were talking about the medical, physical aspect of the war. It's very interesting to read these leaflets now of the White Rose, because they say every time the, every time the Führer opens his mouth, he lies. <laughs> It's like Putin, you know, and and they say he's. You can see that he's speaking from the father of lies. That you can see the metaphysical aspect of this war that he started. You know what I'm saying? So here are voices. Where was that the church speaking? Are these martyrs because all of their heads were chopped off and they're all in their early twenties? You know what I'm saying? This is something we need to a little bit uh, wake up. Uh, to that we are all church and that we need as lay people in the orthodox church monastic monasticism is also a lay movement that's what we need to also remember i always remember that i'm with my people you know what i'm saying and say it like it is you know say it like it is and do what you can and let's let's have this is not shaking my faith in the church it is deepening my faith in the church because we are realizing how we floated along you know with all of this uh orthodoxy and the beautiful singing and the churches and everything and suddenly it seems not all that orthodox it seems actually in some of our areas as we've heard today the largest orthodox church at least officially and on paper um it is spouting out quite satanic things. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sorry, I have to stop saying, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what happened there. Um, Not so, on my account. <laughs> yeah, I think our ecclesiology, let's wait for the bishops to say something, is uh, very, uh, very top heavy. Yeah, I we totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. We, we are on the age of at least uh, putting this question putting this problem before us that something is uh, substantially wrong with kind of the uh, so to say the the popular ecclesiology uh, that we have at least within the Russian Orthodox Church well um as I mentioned at the beginning of of our webinar we could see now I said we are fortunate to have these guests in particular. Uh, there's so many thank yous for this important event uh, to uh, to the two of you. So I want to pass those along and maybe sort of um, uh, put an asterisk on Sitovas' uh, last comments by adding one more. Paul Kariotis says, canonization happens both from the top and the bottom. In other words, the people's veneration is unstoppable. <laughs> There's a kind of lovely strength uh, in, in that thought that I think is appropriate uh, perhaps to end on, and unless you have anything else to add. Uh, there was or, or there the, Ar the archbishopric in Western Europe, the, the Paris jurisdiction that is now under the Moscow Patriarchate, that did make 
a statement, not explicitly, uh, you know, uh, really taking apart this horrible document of the all world Russian uh, so-called council, uh, but look up the statement, everybody, if you're interested, uh, that made clear the Archbishop in Paris said that we are uh, absolutely not interested in this type of ideology. So they said that. Did you see that, Sergei? I'm sure you saw it. Yes, that's right. That's right. Well, uh, there are signs of hope, uh, but they are, I would say, kind of, they're tiny uh, for the moment. They are <laughs> tiny. There is a big sign of hope. That is our Lord Jesus Christ and his cross. There's a, it's not gone anywhere. He, he isn't gone. And uh, I think that in times of crisis, you make a decision. You either grow or you can collapse if you want, right? It's a time of growth. It's a time of, of wonderful rediscovering our faith, rediscovering what is the word orthodox what is it what does it really mean what does it mean to be church has is it what i've been thinking it was well maybe we have to rethink this we have to rethink how it is that we've been sort of automatically or maybe very externally orthodox christians thinking that we are the the right ones all the time uh we're not doing that well that's okay you know that means it's time to a uh, clean house and some people need to be judged e even if it's a patriarch uh that needs to be done and uh, we don't need to peel people please because that uh, nobody needs that that's like salt that has lost its flavor yeah I, I totally that? i totally agree with uh sister vasa it's a brilliant summation and I think that's that's the core uh, because our title is uh, Navalny's legacy, and I could say that uh, this is exactly our Navalny's legacy: personal responsibility for the church, our faith uh, that is not, uh, I would say, are uh, directly linked to church institutions, uh, faith uh, that is not uh, shaped out by religious ideology. Uh, and uh, and uh, yes, and uh, uh, honest and joyful faith in uh, Christ and His resurrection. Uh, thank you both again so much uh, for being here and uh, illuminating this important topic. I um, I would like to also thank uh, the the Orthodox Christian Study Center. Uh, co-directors George Demokopoulos and Aristotle Papanikolaou for the platform. Uh, Associate Director Nathaniel Wood, who is uh, also managing editor of the Study Center's publication of scholarly research called Public Orthodoxy. Uh, special thanks to collaborators, um, Fordham's Executive Assistant Siobhan Verleza and Catherine Mandelakis for helping to organize and promote the event. I will uh, announce that we will have Michael Katz join us next Friday at noon to discuss his brilliant new translation of uh, the Brothers Karamazov. Uh, bring your translation questions to the event, uh, and it, and we've been reading it uh, in my Brothers Karamazov course all, all uh, semester long with an incredibly engaged group of students, uh, so it should be a lively discussion um, as well. Uh, but thank you, uh, Sergei Chepin and Sister Vasa, so much for joining us. Be well.